All right, we're ready to go. So um, today we're going to talk about Wi-Fi planning, and the title is The Seven Secrets. Um, well, that was just to get you guys on board here. There ain't going to be secrets here. It's just, you know, going to be mostly best practices and, and the stuff some of you might know, some of you might not know, and for some of you it might come as a, as a good refresher. So, uh, yeah, just going to talk about Wi-Fi planning and also show a lot of practical examples, uh, like how to actually do this stuff using some of the simulation tools out there. So here's the agenda. Just going to briefly, well, we already talked about who's on the line. Just going to recap that quickly and then a couple of words about why are we here and then just jump right to it after that. So, yeah, talk about the seven secrets and uh, some hands-on demos to go with those as well. So, on the line, in, in addition to uh, the ever so lovely Julia, uh, there's myself. If you're not on Twitter or if you don't follow me on Twitter, feel free to do so. Uh, rather just, if you're not on Twitter, at least go there and uh, and talk, chat with the folks that are out there. I mean, uh, there's so much good Wi-Fi action going on on Twitter, thanks to Julia and the whole Wi-Fi community, you know. Very highly recommended if you're interested in the latest stuff going on with the latest development in Wi-Fi, with the tools, with the people, you know, it, it just gives a whole new, more personal aspect to the whole Wi-Fi community. With me, I have Mikko. Uh, Mikko actually is the guy that makes stuff happen here at Ekahau, uh runs the uh, Ekahau's Wi-Fi tools R&D and acts as a product manager. Mikko, you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Typical Finnish answer. Exactly. So we are, we're all about software development, not so much about chatting. So. Let's just jump right to it. And fo follow Mikko on Twitter. Um, Mikko tweets about our, you know, product releases and, and, and things of that nature quite frequently. So definitely go out there. All right. So why are we here? Mm. At some point, I asked like 20 of the folks in the wi that are active in the Wi-Fi industry on, you know, how they feel about design and site surveys and, and you know, the importance of doing a proper job when deploying Wi-Fi networks. And uh, I collected those together. Those are available on SlideShare and YouTube and wherever. But the, here's a couple of quotes from those guys. Like Daryl says, you know, this is actually, I couldn't put this better myself. So probably a good idea to pay some attention. This guy, Martin, uh, hey, Martin, if you're on the line. Uh, consequently, his name is Ericsson. But he doesn't work for Ericsson, he works for ASCOM. And uh, yeah, he also thinks, feels that, you know, he's been solving these Wi Fi boy problems all his life and uh, with Keith Parsons and the other guys. And, you know, clearly, if you don't plan, you get poor voice quality, drop calls, all that kind of stuff. Ask Carl from NEC, he spent all his life in wireless and, uh, you know, he feels the same as well. And Justin from Skyline, uh, you wouldn't start constructing a building without blueprints. That's, that's well put. The point being that just whatever tools you use, whatever methodologies you use, it's better than nothing. So, so uh, uh, at least do pay some attention to designing Wi-Fi networks. Otherwise, you know, you'll just be in deep stuff later on. So a couple of words about us and CWNP. So we've been working, Ekaha and CWNP have been pretty much working together since like 802.11b days. Um, whereas CWNP obviously provides the knowledge to you guys, we provide some of the tools for Wi-Fi design and deployment. So tools and power equal superpowers, right? Makes sense. So, so we do stuff together, obviously, with CWNP. Uh, things like um, the CWNP trainers use our tools in their classes, um, and thus many of the students end up using our tools as well. So, it's, it's in many ways, it's a partnership that just makes sense. Uh, our guys here at Ekaha have been trained by CWNP instructors 
we we always reference to the CWNP books. Uh, Mikko, when was the last time we ordered a CWNP book this week? Yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. So so you know we just love the CWNP stuff, and especially the new CWNP with Brad and Julia and everybody on board. You know, you guys rock. So. With that said, what do we do in case some of you don't know? Uh, and I'll try to keep the sales pitch at a minimum. But we do Wi-Fi tools, meaning tools for you folks who design, deploy, and maintain Wi-Fi networks, whether it's uh, build it from scratch or troubleshoot my problems or optimize my network performance. You know, we make tools for that. The main tool being our site survey and planning tool that runs today on Windows, uh, tablets, laptops, convertibles, you name it. We also have stuff for Android. We have spectrum analyzers. We have free tools like the heat mapper. Many of you may, may have heard of that as well. So that's really what we do. And we've been doing this since 802.11b, so since like uh, 2002, I think we started. So today we're going to look at uh, the, the tool we will be using for practical examples would be Echo Site Survey Pro with the 3D planner capabilities. So that's the guy that runs on Windows, does planner, site surveys, optimization, troubleshooting, and so on and so forth. So who are we to talk? Are we just you know a couple of guys in a garage? Well, uh, <laughs> not far from it, but but uh, yeah, we've been around and, and we're Echo is like I don't know 100 strong uh, personnel wise, and you know, a lot, a lot of the guys use our stuff, like the Cisco guys, Extreme, Meru, and then obviously the you know largest telecom operators. And going down to the uh, individual one-man consultancy shops, uh, and those are actually one of our biggest customer groups. Are the one or two guy consultancy shops that deploy or design and verify Wi-Fi networks for a living. So all kinds of folks utilize our stuff and we're really happy to have you guys as customers and we have a very active community in Twitter of customers and partners that we talk to actively so again a good reason to follow me or myself oh yeah there was uh, I just side note so if you have any comments any questions regarding this webinar on Twitter as well uh, feel free to throw your stuff there Mikko if you have time uh, also follow Twitter if there's uh, action going on there. I know you're pretty busy with the chat as well. But. All right. So, and you might be saying, let's just jump into the uh, seven secrets already, and we will. So, so here we go. If you only have five minutes today, if you only were in this webinar for five minutes, well, you would have already dropped out. So let's let's say if you only had 15 minutes today. Uh, what would be the lesson? So summarize, this is what we're going to talk about. So you can drop off after this if you're ADHD or in a hurry. Uh, first of all, when designing Wi-Fi networks, you want to talk to people. That's the most important thing. You need to figure out what to do, uh, where to do it, how to do it, what other constraints, what other requirements for capacity coverage and so forth. Secondly, uh, use up-to-date high-quality maps. Thirdly, and this is what we're going to cover a lot, is, is the world is not two-dimensional. So even if you're working, even though you're working with two-dimensional maps, that doesn't mean that the signals go in 2D. So there's high ceilings, there's, you, you know, light pole designs for outdoor, uh, there's buildings blocking your signal, there's walls blocking your signal, there's shelves blocking your signal and stuff like that. So definitely not two-dimensional. Then we're going to briefly talk coverage. But then we'll talk more about channel overlap, which is probably even more important because usually people get coverage somewhat right, but channel overlap then starts to become a problem. And that's related to capacity as well. So um, capacity can be like, as a concept, very, very complex because there's so many factors that come into play, but we'll try to kind of simplify the whole capacity dilemma and make it human understandable. And then there's certainly situations where you don't want to design your Wi-Fi network off-site. So sometimes it just might make more sense and be less expensive to actually go on-site and do your planning 
only on-site instead of trying to off-site simulate what's going to happen. So today we're going to talk mostly about off-site simulation planning and uh, we just might come up with another webinar for example to talk about the verification side of things and the on-site planning and on-site design and troubleshooting and things like that. So what is Wi-Fi planning? What is the, the simulation all about? And why do we plan? Well, first of all, determine the minimum number of APs and their placement, as well as the optimal AP configurations. And these obviously need to satisfy whatever the user's requirements are, whether coverage, capacity, or anything in between. <laughs> All right, thank you for the feedback. It would be good if Yussi would stop pounding so hard on the keyboard between screens. Point taken. Uh, allow me to touch the keyboard more gently. Was that better? How about this? Anyway, <laughs> thank you for the feedback, Howard. Um, so what this slide is all about is the life cycle of a Wi-Fi network, starting with the planning, moving into validation, and then once the network is up, you kind of troubleshoot and monitor and probably report. So for the planning, two main things, requirements and then simulation. With those, you get a pretty good idea of what needs to be done and how it should be done. For the validation part, if I had to name top two, the top two things, that would be site survey followed by spectrum analysis. For troubleshooting, my top two things of choice would be spectrum analysis and packet analysis if it's like a really in-depth problem that can't be solved otherwise. And then for, periodic, uh, for monitoring purposes, you would obviously use your continuously monitoring APs. Uh, your infrastructure does most of the monitoring. But then you could do periodic surveys uh, to make sure that the network actually works from the client perspective. And you could use tools like our Android tool to do continuous Wi-Fi monitoring from the client perspective. Or you, or you could use solutions like 24-7 monitoring solutions. Think 7Signal, for example, provides excellent 24-7 uh, throughput uh, performance spectrum monitoring for your network. It's additional infrastructure, granted, but it does a great job. So again, 7Signal, check those guys out. They do, good, they do good stuff. So there's really various ways to design Wi-Fi networks off-site. Here's my top four list. So the first one would be the best guess method. Just, you know, take a floor plan and throw some APs on a piece of paper, like maybe one here, maybe one there. And the more experienced you are, the better you will be at this, of course. It's not highly scientific, but for very, very experienced folks, it may lead to decent results. Another way of best guessing is don't have a map at all when planning, just go on site and start placing APs. I think the map version of this is better. The second way to design Wi-Fi networks would be the square feet and meter thing. So X number of, eight, oh, let's go back. So calculate the number of square footage of the area. And then there's formula saying like, okay, this is 100,000 square feet. So I'm probably going to need X number of access points. And then just evenly drop them on the floor plan. Not highly scientific either, but if you're, you know, a salesperson for a Wi-Fi vendor just might give you a rough estimate of how many APs you're going to need. Then, as for the map-based stuff and, and like, uh, let's say, tool-based stuff, number three would be map-based ROM. Anybody know what ROM 
stands for in, in planning case? ROM, anybody? Would, that would be rough order of magnitude. So uh, just to get a, a general idea, exactly, rough order of magnitude. So you can do it on a map fairly easily. And then you could do the um, map-based, what, what I would call map-based accurate plan. So that would include the walls and 3D and things like that. So today we're mostly focused on number four, but let's take a quick look at number three first. So, rough order of magnitude planning. How do we do that? Let's just take a look at the tool and see how that works. All right. So what I've done is I brought, and yeah, so this is our site survey slash planning tool. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not seen it. On the left-hand side, we typically have the access point. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the map, and then at the top, we have some tools. All right? So what I've done is I, oh, somebody says lost sound. I hope that's not all of you. Nope. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right. So first of all, it all starts with the map, as it always does. And then for rough order of magnitude planning, what I, what I would do is just define that, yeah, this is actually a school, or this is, uh, let's say, an open office. And then I would define which area is open office. So uh, I'm going to draw it here. So the whole map. Let's say it's open office so that you know we can start planning. And you could do this even in front of a, front of your customer, whether you are a consultant or an AP vendor. Then you would say, okay, now now that we know what your environment looks like, let's start placing some, let's say, Cisco 3600s on the plan. And in here, obviously, you could as well do the Aruba, Aero Hives, the Rocket Thieves, Merus, Motorola, you know, you name it. So it's a dual band access point, the one and 36 meaning, meaning it's on channels one and 36. You would start placing the APs on the floor until you know your coverage meets your expectations. And what I have now set as the minimum limit for signal strength, in this case is NEG67, which is acceptable for VoIP. But, but of course you could set that for higher, or lower, or what have you. Cool, so now we have a decent plan for voice coverage, right? So hey, we have made our rough order of magnitude plan, and on the left-hand side we can see we have 13 access points. That's a pretty decent number for this size of a site. We have some holes, but you know we could move the APs to uh, fill in those holes as well. Then we could, of course, move to floor two and start planning, you, you know, start placing APs there as well. So there's some, as you can see, there's some floor-to-floor uh, -floor bleed through even at NEG67 here. Well, obviously, because these floors are <laughs> on top of one another. Keep placing the APs, stuff like that. So that would be one way to do the rough order of magnitude plan. So in two minutes, we have a decent network plan made. If we wanted to crunch the time to one minute, I would just say, yeah, Teach this plan. So let's go back to the basics. Let's say I had no access points. I would say, yeah, generate the plan automatically for me. And it says draw a coverage area. So indicate where you want coverage. Well, I'll indicate that. Obviously, I want it in the same locations inside the building. All right. So I want coverage there. Then the tool asks, do you want voice coverage or basic email web browsing coverage? So let's say basic email web browsing coverage for, uh, in the, at the side we will have 800 devices altogether, 400 smartphones, 400 laptops. Because it's not just about coverage, it's also about capacity. And then we could say, you know, these laptop users typically use uh, the laptop in certain ways. They use this much VoIP and they use this much video and stuff like that. Obviously, the applications will have a huge impact in what kind of capacity you need. If you're only looking at 800 idle devices, well, obviously, you need just a few APs. But since, since we uh, want these kind of apps to work for all of those client devices, then it's going to be more APs than that. What type of AP do you want to deploy? Well, 
if if I didn't know the brand, I could choose again the discos, the Aruba, whatever. But if I didn't know the brand, I would just say, yeah, I'm going to do an AZ generic one and I'll figure out the brand later. Just hit create plan. And there you go. Pretty similar looking results. A few more APs because we considered capacity in this plan as well. Previously, when we do it, did it uh, just with the uh, using our best guess and, and only signal coverage, the plan looked a little less dense. Now we added some capacity to it, so it's a little more dense. Obviously, the plan would look different if there if we had defined walls and stuff to the uh, to the building, so it would you know start spreading the APs less evenly around and things like that. Okay, so that's kind of the idea how to make a network plan in one minute. And obviously the planner, it didn't just place the APs, it also configured the channels. So 1, 6, 11, 48, 60, so optimize the channels and you can do 40 megahertz, 60 megahertz, whatever. And same thing here in the second floor. First of all, it staggers the APs between the floors so they are not on top of one another and then it also minimizes the channel interference between the floors. So this is the part, especially the channel planning and things like that, where computer is a great assistance. Never trust the plan made by a computer fully, but at least it does a decent job at planning the channels if you don't use Auto RF or RRM or ARM or whatever you call it with your uh, infrastructure. Obviously, if you use Meru, then it's just going to be a single channel blanket architecture usually. Does this make sense? How to do a rough order of magnitude plan? All right. Make sense or not, let's move forward. So let's go to the actual seven secrets. First secret, talk to people. So you need to figure out what exactly is required for the network from the network. And this may sound like, yeah, it's common sense, but some of these aspects may be forgotten. Sometimes you may be so uh, focused, at least I get so focused on the technology aspects of things, I get excited about the latest and greatest APs and stuff like that, that I kind of tend to forget the people aspect of things. So here's a quick checklist. So which area should you cover which should you not cover? Where do you need coverage? Where do you not need coverage? What about the capacity? What kind of capacity requirements do you have for the network? So mostly how many users, what kind of applications for the users, what kind of end user devices? It makes a huge difference whether you have a B client as opposed to AC client, because the B clients will just kill your network in terms of capacity. Take them out. Another important factor is where the APs cannot be placed. So you need to define the areas where you're not allowed to place the APs, even if you need coverage in those areas, especially aesthetically interesting sites like museums and, and hotels, fancy hotels, things like that. There may, might be a lot of locations where you just can't place the APs. Then there's obviously budgetary con constraints. I hope they are not driving everything, but usually they have a pretty big impact to the uh, design. And then there's the whole vendor constraints. We're a Cisco shop, we're an Aruba shop, we're a Rocket shop. And then what kind of deliverables do you, do you need? What kind of reports do you need to hand out? How many weeks are you going to spend, you know, writing Word documents and drawing graphs? And obviously the schedule. So that's secret number one. What about secret number two? The maps. You know, pay more attention to the maps than this one here. I mean, it's a pretty good treasure map. It's right behind the mountains. Not necessarily the best for Wi-Fi planning. And bad maps might be okay for performing site surveys. That's fine, because 
site, when, when you're performing site surveys, and by that I mean not predictive site surveys, but on-site surveys. When you're doing on-site surveys, even if you take a picture of the fire escape plan and, and you know, just plot your route on that, that's probably fine because that's using real measured data and there's not no a prediction associated with that. But when you're doing simulation, you want the maps to be accurate. Okay. So what's good? White background in the maps is good because we're overlaying heat maps on them anyway, right? And they're easy, overall easy to read. The maps need to have one-to-one -one proportions. What was what was Julia again the the correct term for this? Proportionate or so, something like that. Well, anyway, yeah, they need to be like x-axis needs to be the same as y-axis. They can't, shouldn't be stretched in any way. The maps, otherwise, you'll run into huge prediction problems. Proportionate. Thank you, Julia. And then the maps should indicate the meters or feet scale, because that's what you need to put in your simulation tools, whatever you're using as well. So, and you know, using a doorway for the scale is, it's better than nothing. But if you think of accurate plans, you should really have a longer distance that you measure the scale on. Because if you measure the doorway, let's say instead of three feet, you put four feet, uh, then you have a 70 or 25 percent problem or 25% error throughout your plans. And obviously the maps need to be overall easy to read, they need to be up to date, stuff like that. So here's a no-go for a map. It is stretched, it is hard to read, it doesn't have a white background, impossible to see the room, room explanations. Here's a better one. Anybody realize where this map is from? Whose house is it? it it's not mine. It's not Mikko's either. All right, moving on. How much time do we have? It's, what, what time is it? The map got it, by the way, right? <laughs> good job. So 25 minutes today. 25 minutes time. Good, good. So secret number three is, yeah, 3D. So buildings are not 2D and the, the shapes and sizes and atriums and everything, it makes it very, very challenging. So first things first, and this is obvious, signals do travel not just through the walls, but through the floors as well. And if you look at an AP coverage on the floor below, it actually does provide quite significant coverage. So do count for that both for signal coverage wise and interference wise. And this is even more important. So when doing high ceiling environment, you know, the irregular omnis just don't come to the ground and, or don't cover the ground level very well if you place them at 30 feet or 60 feet height. So you need to either rotate the omnis in different ways or you need to use directional antenna. So don't think that the omnis at 60 feet will cover your forklift trucks because they won't. We've tried that. Another example of 3D. Um, so, so signals, and, and this is kind of important that the, the shelves, for example, in retail and warehousing, do accommodate and, and do consider the fact that the shelves do block some of the signals, but not all of the signals, because there's, there's a certain height to the shelves as well, right? So let's let's just illustrate that uh, real quickly. The whole 3D thing. So, tabula rasa, let's take out the piece here. Take out even the uh, generic attenuation layer. 
here we go. So let's say this was a was a warehouse. I'm going to, so to speak, raise the roof to be, uh, and let's change to feet because this is mostly a U.S. audience. I think I, I think I saw a comment about can it handle feet as well. So let's take feet for the tool, and then uh, raise the raise the roof of this uh, into 60 feet of floor number one. So this is now very high floor, and what we're going to do is place an AP on the floor, just a single radio, simple AP, with a highly directional antenna. And for this example, I just can't refuse the urge of using a HP 14 dBi highly directional Yagi. All right? So, now we have an AP in this uh, area. That's fine. Has a directional antenna, a single radio, but the AP is now placed on two point or uh, how high is the AP placed again? It's at seven point nine feet. So don't make the mistake of thinking that this is how your warehouse will work if you do a ceiling placement for the APs, because it won't. Uh, so let's raise that AP to fifty feet. All right. Wow, not much coverage anymore at NEC67, so don't expect your voice calls to work. What we can do is actually we will start pointing the uh, direction of the antenna downwards. So, and let's move the AP a bit so that we can see both at the same time. Just going to move the AP to the other side of the building, if you don't mind. So not much coverage there. Now we, are, we have pointed the AP, as you can see, to the left. Let's start tilting it down. So think, think of this as the side load of the antenna. If that's proper English, I don't know. Let's just start pointing it down. And as you can see, the, the closer to the ground we point it, the better the coverage at the ground level will be. So we could put it somewhere here, for example, to provide decent coverage underneath the AP and a little further out as well. So that's kind of one way to look at the three-dimensionality. High, high placement of antenna equipped with a directional antenna to the side and tilting down, so providing down tilt. All right? That's one thing. So now let's see the difference between a shelf and a wall. So first, let's place a wall here around the AP. Okay, that's a concrete wall, so it blocks all of the signals. That's fine, but what if it was only a shelf? So let's make that actually 10 feet high. So huge difference, obviously. The signals are only blocked right after the shelf. So again, the difference between a full wall and a shelf is humongous, especially in high ceiling environments. So do account for that. Same thing with semi high, other semi high things, like for example, cubicles. So obviously, cubicles have an impact to your signal, if, especially if you have a, let's say, a building full of cubicles, think of call centers, things like that. So you I like to just define an area of cubicles and then see the impact of that to the overall uh, signal. Obviously, since we have a pretty low cubicles here and the AP is placed really high, the cubicles don't have an impact to the uh, to the network or to the to the uh, network coverage that much. But if we drop the AP from 50 feet to let's say six feet. The cubicles have a huge impact because every cubicle, every person in that cubicle will block the signal, so the signal will drop quite quickly. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's why it's important to think 3D when planning. Mikko, any uh, 
frequently asked questions, anything that keeps coming up? Well, not frequently, uh, frequent questions, but I do have a list of questions. So we go through through this. What yeah, do you think? yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, that this one we have heard already in the past webinar. So, do we take reflecting materials in account? Reflecting materials, uh, so so things like mm, shiny metal and things exactly like that. Exactly like that. So, our planner, like I would claim, most of those out there mostly rely on path loss, so not so much on reflections. And our, I like to say, our planner is mm, path loss plus a few magic things here and there to kind of account for the reflection and diffraction and things like that. But does it perfectly account for reflection? Absolutely not. Uh, if we did, we would have to model also, you know, all the pieces of furniture, including their metal parts and stuff like that. So uh, I would say computationally, it's a difficult challenge. It would take quite a long time to calculate accurately. And also for the user to define such a such an environment would be a challenge. So there's always a you know cost benefit ratio here. Good. All right, how would you measure the attenuating uh, attenuation, for example, in warehouses or just the attenuation of, of walls or good question. So you have an exotic wall uh, somewhere and you don't know how much it attenuates. I would place an AP uh, on one side of the wall and then measure the signal right next to the AP. And then I would measure the signal uh, right after the wall on the other side of the wall and then subtract one from the other. And then you would get kind of the dB loss of the wall. Then you would measure the thickness of the wall and then you would get the dB per meter loss of the wall as well. And I assume the same thing with the bear has rack as well. Yeah, yeah, same, same stuff, right? Exactly. Um, very good question, or uh, also, how about our mesh support? Mesh network support. Yes. So, like APs that have air-to-air -air links and discuss with one another, stuff like that. Mm, I would say we support mesh networks in a way that, you know, whatever the client device experience is from the net mesh networks that we simulate. But um, there is a few workarounds that you can do to kind of see how the uh, AP is here one another, but there's no mesh network support per se in the tool. This comes up quite frequently, so yeah. I think we need to uh, discuss that in more detail. And if, uh, if you guys want to uh, you know, also take part in this discussion, let's talk about mesh support on Twitter or LinkedIn or yeah. anywhere. We'd be happy to hear your thoughts on how it should work what is the number one, number two problems in network mesh network designs that we should solve and stuff like that. So uh, please, and on the chat board even, uh, this whole chat board is logged, so uh, we will get that later on as well. But let's continue discussion about that. Anything else uh, that we have as for? That's pretty much it, that um, cover line. All right, all right, awesome. All right. Um, <clears throat> next thing, outdoor planning. What about outdoor planning? So, my answer to outdoor planning is: first of all, it's um, it depends on what kind of environment you're doing. If you're doing urban outdoor, it's fairly straightforward in a sense that you just define the buildings and their heights, and you can just put a generic building attenuation factor for each building. Uh, put in the heights of the buildings, and then if you need to do outdoor coverage for an urban area, then you can you know, define a reasonably sized section of a city in 15, 20 minutes quite nicely. Um, and that's what our tool does as well. But if you're looking for like covering square miles and square miles of mountainous areas uh, throughout rural landscapes, then, uh, you know, first of all, I don't think it's very often done with Wi-Fi, but when it is, then there's pr different tools for that, but our tool doesn't do it, and I, I don't have much experience on that, so I, I'd rather, you know, not try to be an expert where I'm not. But definitely doable. All right, secret number four, coverage design. So. 
This is really the easiest part of the puzzle, but only a small part of it. So just to illustrate how, how coverage is never circular is, for example, this AP here, on top of the AP or, or to the north from the AP, you have a staircase to the south of the AP, you have an elevator shaft. So coverage definitely is not circular. This just has to say that, you know, if you even just draw the main walls of your building and associate some rough wall materials with those walls, your plan will become so much more accurate. If we only assume circular coverage for all the APs, then, you know, in all the APs, in all the buildings, you will be more or less inaccurate, sometimes dead in the water. So when it comes to coverage design, just pay attention to highly attenuating walls and areas as seen in the previous picture. And also consider the AP overlap, because often it is required that you have two APs covering the uh, area. For example, the primary AP has to be NEG 67 dBm everywhere, and the secondary AP needs to be NEG 72 or 75 everywhere, just to make sure you have good voice coverage you're covered for roaming, stuff like that. And then do consider floor-to-floor -floor bleed. We saw that in the uh, earliest aspect as well. And the other 3D aspects as discussed earlier. So then there's the whole overlap thing. And there's two types of overlap, right? The good kind of overlap which you need for roaming and, and you know, lo load balancing and, and uh, high availability and whatnot. So two APs covering one area is good in that sense. But too many APs in the same channel is bad, obviously, because just one Wi-Fi device can talk at a time in a given channel. You don't want a lot of APs in the same or nearby channels at the same location, because you will kill your throughput. And this is why, and Keith Parsons uh, like, um, teaches this all the time, that adding APs Throwing APs at the problem usually doesn't solve it, it makes it worse. And this, I'm sh sure um, mm -hmm. you've seen a few times. So just to say there's a limited number of channels available, especially on 2.4. You see something again. Yeah, when I get excited, I thank the keyboard. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, so. 2.4, three usable channels. Then there's the whole, okay, I need more capacity. Which channel do I put the next AP? Because I've already used channels 1, 6, and 11. Where do I put the next one? Well, you really don't have a choice. You put it on channel 1, and there's called channel interference. So, you know, it didn't help much, did it? You put those on channel 1 and channel 2, you'll encounter even more problems called adjacent channel interference. So that's just consider the overlap. Let's take a quick demo of the overlap so that it's not just dead by PowerPoint. I'm going to do a super quick plan here. I'm going to open up the original project first. Oh, and we actually might have APs in place already which we do. So, um, and let's make a worst case scenario. Let's put all the AP, all the 2.4 gigahertz radios. I'm going to select all of those. And I'm going to put those all on channel one just to make a worst case scenario. Okay. So all of the 2.4 gig radios on channel one. And then let's look at channel overlap. So it looks pretty bad on 2.4 gigahertz, not too surprising. So four or more APs audible in almost every location. A couple of ways to resolve this overlap problem. Start manually assigning the channel. So yeah, I'm gonna edit that radio, put it on six. Then I'm gonna put the next one to 11. And you can see that the situation slowly but surely starts turning from red 
to green, right? So as I change from 401 to 1611, of course it gets better. But what do I need to do to make this more quickly? So keep the channel planner. I want to optimize both 2.4 and 5. Actually, let's use 20 megahertz for this design on 5 gigahertz and use all the available 5G channels, VFS or not. And let's see what happens. So the situation got quite a bit better. Obviously, since it's 2.4, it's pretty crowded. There's never a perfect solution for the channels. This is just one computerized example. And, uh, you know, we could rerun it and see if we come up with different different uh, solutions the next time. No, not any better. So, anyways, it, it became at least, you know, almost all green, so, some red there. Uh, then the next step could be, like, disabling radios, starting to crank down transmission power, things like that. Nico, snapping his fingers like he has in the state. So he just asking is there an option to show a percentage of the channel overlap? So, yes, how would you do that? Oh, Miko, but this feature was developed when I was not working at Eka House. Mm. It's a trick question. Uh, I, I, good question. I never remember to even show this beautiful feature. So, absolutely, I could show the channel overlap visualization statistics. Did you ask somebody to uh, ask this question? Try to get <laughs> anyway, so so yeah, if you want it like percentage-wise, how much overlap do I have on this map? Uh, just click this bar button here, and you you will figure it out. So uh, we have 73% no overlap, and then some uh, two AP overlap, three AP overlap here and there. So that's channel overlap. How much time do we have? Not much, I guess. But we are already on secret number six, aren't we? Okay. Yeah, and we are five, two. So, <clears throat> real quickly, because there's only so much load an AP can take at a time, and there's some, these are just ballpark numbers, but there's a limit for the number of associations per radio, limit for throughput per radio at best. And then there's the limit for simultaneous voice calls per radio. Th these are like, no matter what you do, pretty much these are the, the limits. To make things more interesting, there's only so much air time for each channel. So adding APs may not help at all. And then you throw some retro devices to the mix, like those 8011B clients. You need to use that in your capacity calculations as well, because they have a dramatic impact to your network. OK, so how do we deal with this complex problem? I thought I had a few more slides about that. Do we want to see them? Well, here's just. Just to say that uh, capacity planning is complex because it just has so many variables that come into play, like you know the number of users, the devices, the uh, you know other devices, the applications, and then which areas do I need to cover? What kind of APs? Do I have a mixture of legacy APs and and regular AP or like modern APs? What kind of walls do you have? The list is just endless, or at least seemingly so. So, as seen before, luckily, this is a pretty easily computerized problem. So you can just tell the tool to design a network that works for all of these clients using all of these applications. So this is pretty easily computerized, at least to some extent. But this is a garbage in, garbage out kind of a thing. So if you don't define accurately how many devices are going to be there, and if you don't have any idea of what the device behavior typically is, then, you know, it's just not going to be too good. But even a rough estimation, obviously, is better than nothing. So create me a plan based on this capacity. And then once you have made that plan, you can observe, like, how many clients am I going to have associated for each radio, given those 
criteria that we just gave for capacity or given those capacity numbers. Oh, we want to enable two, four as well, and five. So how many clients are going to be associating into each radio based on that we have 500 laptops, 500 smartphones, we have 200 of them on this map. This map. So you can start doing that kind of analysis. The more important thing is the overall capacity. Is it enough or not? Do I have too many voice calls? Do I have too many associations per AP? Do I have too, you know, too little air time period? So in here, it seems that you know, capacity seems to work. But if we started adding some, let's say, AWD clients to the mix and stuff like that, then things might get a little different. So I threw in 1,500 BG VoIP phones, and now in this area, we start to uh, have problems with the voice calls, okay? Different reasons for different failures in capacity, but this would be one example. All right, so that's capacity. Last thing, what was the last thing? when you should not plan. So if it's quicker or cheaper to do it on site rather than simulation, probably just better going there. So, and this is not to say you shouldn't plan on or simulate these environments. A lot of people do, but the mountainous areas and hills and huge areas like that, and yeah, it's gonna be challenging. Stadiums, actually many people these days, they do plan stadiums using our tool. Some people still don't want to do it. Some people do want to do it. So, uh, but a lot of the guys, whatever you do on, in stadiums, do go on site after that. And that's stadiums, for example, a huge use case for our capacity planner because there's a lot of folks there. What do you think, Nico? Like stadiums, 30,000 people. How many APs do you need? I don't remember. I was just at the AT&T park and. They seem to have quite a few, like almost under like every fifth or every tenth seat they had, like under seat placement of an AP, and it seemed to work pretty darn well, even with like 50,000 people. Do we have any models that we could check that from? We do have projects from customers, but can we show them? Unfortunately not. But we'll, we'll figure out from them. All right, so just a couple of examples on, on the more difficult simulation uh, environment. So that's secret number seven. I'm out there. Any questions? Any final comments? Julia? You're still there? You asleep? You got your caffeine? Yeah, Julia's out. Which one? Would you you better get a should get a better mic. I should still get a better mic. Shoot, still not good, huh? This was an iPhone, man. <laughs> the highest of quality. <laughs> Does that explain? <laughs> yeah, probably. Glad we know from guy. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't, you know, do this call over Wi-Fi. Julia is gone. That's fine. Um, hey, thanks everybody for joining. Um, very much appreciate you guys being here, being so active on the chat board. Uh, I do hope we have an opportunity to do more of these um, webinars in the future. Feel free to contact us, uh, email us. Please do join the CWNP conference on September 22nd, I believe, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, check out the CWNT website for that. Uh, I will be there. Uh, a lot of the Wi-Fi guys will be there from Xtreme and, and the other vendors. And I'm really looking forward to that event. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, do follow us on Twitter. See you there. Uh, any feedback you have from about the presentation, about our tools, 
about where to get a good microphone for the next webinar, just to let us know. Thanks a lot, Mikko, for moderating the chat and uh, being a huge part of this. Thanks a lot, Julia, for all the arrangements. Fantastic. Take it easy, guys.